chapter 6, verses 19 to 33. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust consumes and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. No one can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate the one and love the other or be devoted to the, to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life what you will eat or what you will drink or about your body or what you wear is not life more than food and the body more than clothing look at the birds of the air they neither sow nor reap nor gather into the barns and yet your heavenly father feeds them are you not of more value than they and which of you by worrying can add a single hour to your span of life and why do you worry about clothing Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the, gr the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown in the oven, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, what will we eat, what will we drink, or what will we wear? For it is the Gentiles who seek all these things, and indeed your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. This is the word for the people of this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. So let me begin this sermon by asking um, when I say the word passion, uh, what does passion mean? mean to you? I want you to think about that. What does passion mean to me? Passion isn't really a word we use that often when we're talking to other people, but when it comes up, it's kind of um, unmistakable. It has a certain energy to it. And when I think about passion, I, I think about energy. You know, if I'm passionate about something, that's where my energy is going to be directed. Uh, and it's that quality that makes passion unmistakable, you know? Uh, to, to you, passion makes you focus on what you love, you know, what you love to do, the people that you love. And to an outside observer, yeah, like it's plain to see when someone is passionate about something. That kind of energy is contagious, often contagious. You know, you, you might not have had, perhaps, uh, a desire to do a certain activity. And then you saw somebody else who was very passionate about it do it, and then you were like, hey, like, maybe I can do that too. That looks interesting. And it's easy, of course, to lose yourself in your passions, you know. Um, let me give you an example. My wife loves, loves, absolutely loves to research Methodist history. That's not the only historical focus she has, but she loves to do it. In fact, she loves to do it so much that she can spend hours uh, doing research at the museum and archive that she manages over at Lovely Lane, and she'll lose all track of time, you know? No lunch break, just keeps on going. I remember when she first got started in that role, um, she was in the vault. Yes, we have like a whole vault, a big vault. And uh, in it are, you know, closed church records, a lot of old historical documents from way back at the beginning of American Methodism, artifacts from our history, etc. And a lot of this stuff, if you've ever been in an archive or a vault, gets kind of shoved into the corners, um, into filing cabinets, sometimes without labels. And you never know what you're going to find until you start doing some digging. And she loves doing the digging. So, and she, she's done so much of it that she has actually found items from our history that got her on the front page of the Sun paper. You might, I, I, you, some of you might have even seen her on the front page. Uh, she found a last will and testament of Thomas Koch, one of the founders of American Methodism. And that's what got her on the front page. So sometimes 
you know, getting into your passions can uh, lead to very interesting uh, destinations. I'm kind of like that with video and sound, in case you hadn't figured that out. I'm a techie, but I really like video and sound. There's something about uh, getting visual images of people and things and the way they sound and making them their best for an audience. I love that. And those, seeing people react to that, to that work. Um, before pandemic, I wasn't even interested in it at all. I mean, we're talking 2020 here. I'd lived, you know, all these years of my life, four, 40 years of my life up to that point, never really having dabbled in any of that stuff. I remember one time I was asked to uh, uh, go to the mixing board that's back there uh, where Steve is standing in a different church, and I was asked to, uh, oh, would you be willing to mind the mixing board during worship? And I was like, okay, like, I don't know what I'm doing, you know? And so they showed me a couple of things and I kind of muddled through it. And I thought, well, probably never again, because I don't think I want that kind of pressure. But like all pastors at that time during pandemic, we were all just trying to find a reasonable way to get people to uh, be able to worship again when they couldn't come into their buildings. So I kind of went whole hog into it and $20,000 later, um, I am where I am today and I love it. Now, I will say <laughs> that the founders of Methodism, and what I'm about to present to you might seem a little bit dry, but I'm going to do my best to kind of keep it from going in that direction. You see, they were very intentional, very methodical, uh, about cultivating spiritual discipline, and not as something that you just kind of do and then revisit from time to time when maybe like you need it, something happened in your life, you need to revisit it. No, this would be daily practices, which for a lot of Christians, especially in America, it's not really something that we do. There are certainly people who practice spiritual disciplines, but it's not really something we talk about much. Um, now, they weren't coming up with yet another set of rules to follow when it came to their faith practice. No, they were trying to get the most that they could out of their faith experience. You have to understand that at a time when religious practice was done more out of obligation, like seriously legal obligation in the Church of England, if you didn't attend worship at least three times in a year, there were penalties for that. They were trying to find a way to attend to their faith and make it into something that they could be passionate about together. Now, this sermon series on stewardship uh, that we're about to conclude, it was built around that framework, the three general rules. We call them the three simple rules sometimes. Do no harm, do good, and today we're talking about staying in love with God. Now, that's not the way that it was uh, written in the rules. That's something that a wonderful bishop named Reuben Job kind of, he tried to distill that last rule into something less dry and something that could like relate to a modern audience. And the third rule in its original description was attending upon all the ordinances of God. So when you hear the word ordinance, like what do you think of? Rules the law, like there are ordinances we have to follow, right? You know, things of that nature. And I think that was sort of the intention, but I think it was really more, less a rule and more guiding principles. But they had these ordinances that the founders described out of what they saw was happening in scripture and how people seemed to encounter God. And they were using these ordinances to help their faith become more real. So there were, there were six of them. I'll read them to you. Uh, there was public worship, so like what we're doing right now, church. Uh, family and private prayer. Receiving sermons, or just people who were willing to kind of expound upon what they were reading in scripture. Holy communion, you know, we do that here in church. Bible study, uh, and there are all kinds of Bible study. And then fasting or abstaining from the consumption of certain food and drink, uh, specifically alcohol, right? So together, these formed uh, what they called the means of grace. So 
that's just kind of the way that we might experience God's grace directly, but in a disciplined, hopefully passionate, and very intentioned way. So, uh, you know, I'm quite keen on cooking. I, I love to cook, and I like to cook professionally. Um, I had considered that route for myself, but I got a call to ministry. I went that route. But it's still, my experience in the kitchen still really helps me in my ministry. And I know for a fact that a chef um, is going to use all five of their senses in the kitchen to manage things like food prep and timing, you know, making sure everything comes out in an orderly fashion so when the customers come in, they get their meal in a timely fashion. They're not sitting around waiting 40 minutes, you know, for a steak. These ordinances operated in much the same way. They offered a way for pretty much any believer to not just sit on their laurels and think to themselves, oh, you know, if only God would come down, you know, maybe one of these days I'm going to encounter God in worship or wherever I am. No, these were created for people to go out and seek God, not wait for God. Let me switch gears. So we might not be very passionate about money. I don't know too many people passionate about money. I mean, I, we need it, you know, and we all go about getting it in different ways. But boy, howdy, are we willing to endure hell itself to attain it, you know? Everyone here has some kind of horror story about the workplace. There are so many people satisfied with working tedious, unfulfilling jobs or suffering toxic, uh, hostile work environments, to not thrive in the world, just to survive. Hopefully, maybe to fund things that matter to us, maybe even a vacation from time to time, if that's even in your calculus. That's why when I think about passion and the way I define passion, I like to think about it in terms of energy, because it would be easy to think that somebody who spends a lot of time doing something is probably passionate about doing it. But based on that previous illustration, how we spend our time doesn't necessarily reveal our passion. It certainly does reveal our emphasis, but not our passion. Now, in our passage from Matthew, it seems to me that Jesus understands this distinction between passion and emphasis when he speaks to people about storing up treasures for yourself on earth. But I want you to really listen carefully here and try to understand what's going on in the background. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also, and no one can serve two masters. I really want you to stop and think about who Jesus was talking to. How many of those people, heck, if you could even put a percentage on it, how many of those people had any treasure to speak of, to store on earth? Well, if you know anything about the era, um, the answer might be uh, a very small minority. I think they would understand serving two masters very well because slavery was a little bit different in those days. I think they could understand what it meant to serve a master. But not so much the whole idea about stacking wealth upon wealth, you know? So um, our, I would say that our passions consume our hearts. They also dominate our lives. In fact, if we didn't have uh, obligations like children, spouses, anything else, um, we would probably just be entirely into our passions. Uh, you may have heard about the promise of AI and how it's going to get rid of a lot of the tedious things we do. We don't have an answer for what it'll do to the workforce yet, but it'll allow us to focus more on our creativity and our passions. That might be a good or bad thing. Now, as you study this passage here, some people are going to think that Jesus is talking about greed. And in fact, as I have gone through church, this series of passages was often used to describe what greed does to a person and how we should not do it. But again, consider the audience. Consider the consoling messages that Jesus is giving to people to not worry about certain things. And what are those things? 
basic things, what we will eat, what we will wear, what we will drink. I don't think he's addressing greedy people here. Those are basic concerns. The audience he's talking to worry about basic concerns. You know, sure, can a, per, a poor person be greedy? Absolutely, maybe after a windfall, when they have something to be greedy about. You've probably heard about those terrible stories when a, a poor person comes into some money for one reason or another, and it makes their lives more miserable than before. Rare examples, but an example. But I don't think Jesus is talking about greed here. No, I, I think he's talking about something more problematic, especially when it comes to faith. I think he's addressing the anxiety that comes from being poor. This nagging message in the back of your mind, and by the way, you don't have to be poor to have this message. You could just be living hand to mouth, paycheck to paycheck, house poor as they say sometimes. This nagging message in the back of the mind urging someone without means to work harder, just to survive, just to make it through the day, just to make sure your children are fed, roof over their heads. I mean, that kind of anxiety, that takes up a lot of gray matter. What room is there for the hope that God can give when we trouble ourselves so much with bare survival? Even more so if somebody is depending upon our ability to earn for their support. Jesus is urging the reader to try to hopefully find a way to set aside the incessant need to strive after the security that wealth can bring, because that's what we're really talking about here, right? Not so much money, security in favor of the life-giving passion that faith in God can bring to seek after righteousness and not gain. Because there's something very important happening in the background of something like that. You see, God did not intend for our mere survival. If that was what God was, I would not be a pastor. I would never come to church. Survival? No. Creation was given to us as a gift it is something that we are supposed to be thriving in. God did not create it for us to just survive in. Now, I, I will say that I do believe that in this message from Jesus, I do think that there is something to be said about greed here, especially that whole bit about storing up treasures. That can apply to a, a minority of us. Because, you know, the idea of a poor person having any sort of treasure I hate to say it, but it's laughable. No. I think the crux of this matter has to do with how wealth appears to deliver security. Because as you know, wealth can be eliminated in moments. It can be stolen or destroyed by outside forces. I described to the kids, hey, they're, you know, one of the biggest ways that we try to save for the future is by buying a house, a dream that is becoming increasingly unobtainable uh, by a number of Americans. And that asset is what we call an appreciating asset. Over time, we expect it to increase in value, and it supports us. We either keep living in it or we sell it. And it's sort of like another retirement fund for many of us. What are all those people in the affected regions in the southeast who are depending upon those homes that they've lost going to do now? All that security wiped away. Maybe some of you here suffer during uh, the Great Recession, as they called it, in 2008, when so much wealth was just, it just evaporated seemingly overnight as a result of that financial crisis. Now, Jesus says, you've got to stop behaving like there's no God under heaven who cares about you. All this energy that we use to try to obtain our security, not even just financial security, I'm talking about security in general. All this energy 
it can, all our efforts can be dashed in moments. No, the ultimate commodity is not wealth. Security doesn't come from wealth, it comes from time. Time is the ultimate commodity. No amount of wealth is ever going to buy you any more time. Hence, can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? That's what the text says. You know, how we spend our time is far more valuable than how much wealth we have. Jesus said that the pagans, so anyone who wasn't a Jew, the pagans run after all these things, the basics, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. And you might ask yourself, well, Jesus, shouldn't I worry about those things? You know, I, I do worry about those things. I worry about my ability to provide security to the ones I love, to myself, you know, and there is a lot of inequity in the world, I know that, an ever-evaporating set of resources available to us, seemingly concentrated in a top 5% of people. One of the greatest consequences of wealth and equity is homelessness and poverty, and that's where the mind goes when we think about this rat race we're in. How do I avoid it? I don't want to be part of that. Homelessness, poverty, bless you. But, you know, those things don't exist because God put them there, right? Those things exist for the very reason that Jesus describes these pagans as worriers, because the race to find security for ourselves and those we care about, it often comes at the expense of other people, not necessarily through our doing, right? But as I've been careful to describe in this sermon series, corporations and high wealth individuals are often willing to employ questionable business practices in the name of greater profit and their own unique form of desperation, that is of appeasing shareholders. The same was true in Jesus' time. Yeah, the economy might have been slightly different, you know, different factors. But the consequences were the same. Homelessness, poverty. And I think the key to rebalancing the world, I think what Jesus thinks the key to rebalancing the world is, I think it lies in mentality. So if you go to verses 22 and 23, you know, they, they kind of read funny depending on the translation, the English translation you're using. Uh, you might not have understood the example there, so I'll read it again. It says, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. Now that sounds a little bit like, it could be blindness maybe Jesus is talking about, something to do with the eyes. It kind of makes sense, but Unless you really dive into the Greek, you don't really understand what's being said there. I'm hoping that my translation will help you there. So some folks think that the words healthy and unhealthy might be better translated instead as generous and stingy. You see, some languages, like ancient Koine Greek, they use illustrative language to sort of vivify what is being said. But that's lost in translation. We are a very literal people when we talk in English. There isn't a lot going on in the background, and depending on uh, what form of uh, uh, European ancestry you might have, uh, let's say German, that some of those languages can be very explicit. You have to give not just the words that you're speaking, but all of the con uh, context all in the same sentence for people to understand what you're saying. And that's what's going on here. I want you to think about a generous person. What kind of face does a generous person have? I would say that a person who is generous has bright eyes, you know, happy faces, you know, a sort of almost a light coming from them, um, and definitely a form of contentment. They seem so content. But what does a stingy person do? 
A squinting, scrutinizing gaze, suspicious of everyone and their intentions. An Ebenezer Scrooge, right? A stingy person, when you think about them, they're all internal. Everything flows into someone like that, like a big black hole. There's no light coming out of them. A generous person, quite the opposite. They flow outward. They are eager to see what the impact might be of their actions because their passion, their gratification, doesn't lie inside of them, but in the happiness that they bring to other people. They're always looking to see what's going on. Imagine how business, how finance, might be transformed if the influence of a generous mindset were to pervade everything being done. When I first began to study financial principles, one of the earliest lessons I had was, was that you always had to look at the numbers in a way that rounded down and not up. Always plan for the worst possible thing. Be conservative, right? So I, when you look at the numbers and there's a decimal point there, no, you don't round up, you round down because that's what you're supposed to do. Imagine if we did the opposite. Maybe not so literally. I think it would be a revolution, frankly. Now, as we finish our third and final week of our stewardship series, I really do hope that you've gained some insight into how to turn giving um, away from something that we do just out of mere obligation towards something that we do out of love for God, something that brings us into a closer relationship with God. I do believe that it should be something that we are passionate about, something that even we're, we're willing to share about. And yes, I do believe that it should be a spiritual discipline, or it shouldn't be done. Much like these ordinances I mentioned that the early Methodists devoted themselves to, the Bible study, the fasting, the worship, etc., so I gotta ask you, how much time do you make for practices like that? I'm talking about spiritual disciplines now. How much time do you make for spiritual disciplines? I, I don't know about you, but as I grew up in the church, that wasn't really something we spoke about too often. Like you had to go to like a workshop for that or like a clinic. It certainly wasn't talked about a lot in the midst of worship. And by the way, I'm not even talking about things as specific as that list I read to you. I mean, frankly, any regular practice that you engage in, that you can tell is bringing you closer to God, because let me tell you, you'll be able to tell if it is. Anything like that is fair game. You know, I've heard some folks say, I like to be in nature. I like to listen for God in nature. You know, or some people, they really like to work with their hands, you know, they've, they've always got to be moving and there's got to be action. So they do acts of charity, you know, or they go and do missionary work. All of that can be effective. All of that can be a spiritual discipline so long as they're done with intent and with regularity. Intention and regularity. Spiritual disciplines are vital to cultivating our faith. And I dare say, I could not be a pastor if I did not practice them. There's just so much on your shoulders. But that's true of anyone with a lot of responsibility, as much if not all of you are. And giving can and should be a form of spiritual discipline. The key is to do it regularly and with intention. Now, that can be here to Epworth, of course. Yeah, that would be great, you know. Anything uh, that, that you are willing to provide, we can turn that into something good, and we're doing it together as a congregation. But as I described my giving practices and that of my wife, you know, we move around from time to time. We can't keep giving to every church that we're at, so we're very specific about what we're passionate about giving to. And we sit down every year and we think about what is our giving going to be and to who. And giving doesn't need to be just about money, by the way. Because the last thing that God wants 
for us to do is to force ourselves back into a survival mentality just because we decided to sacrifice a portion of our income that we might stress about, hey, it probably could have just gone to making it every day. That's not the offering God wants. Yeah. So on this week's resource page, and that's available uh, in the back, and that's week three of three simple rules of stewardship. At the bottom of that page is a prayer uh, that I hope will be helpful to you should you choose to use this resource. It speaks to this idea of generosity and sacrifice, and it gives uh, the, the, the one using it an opportunity to admit our fears and perhaps even our selfishness when it comes to our money. It also asks the disciple to talk directly to God about placing one's entire trust in the Lord, which can be a scary thing. And if you would ever would like to speak with me uh, about the topic of stewardship, specifically how it can become a spiritual discipline for you, I am happy to make the time. May God bless you all, and amen. <laughs>